Hey y'all, welcome to the Short Read Workshop Day 1 video for Illumina sequencing technology. I've talked a little bit about how to set up a sequencing experiment. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about how sequencing works, specifically how Illumina sequencing works. There's a variety of other sequencing technologies out there. Some of them are short read, some of them are long read. It really depends on your application, which one you actually want. There are some applications for which long read sequencing technologies are much better. Illumina is still the workhorse of short read sequencing technology. And the reason that we're going to talk exclusively about Illumina sequencing and data analysis for Illumina sequencing data is that Illumina as one of the pioneers of the technology and the main platform out there has the most library prep kits that are directed towards it, has the most troubleshooting available for it, and also has the most software that is dedicated toward analyzing that type of sequencing data. So that's the reason that we are focusing on Illumina. If you might want something different, then you can investigate these other options. And in fact, in the future, many of these other options might become more prevalent and more useful for different types of sequencing experiments. When you strip it down to the basics, Illumina sequencing technology is imaging a slide or flow cell with millions or billions of DNA clusters by sequentially cycling in fluorescent nucleotides. The first step of this is actually generating the flow cell with your library. So I mentioned the P5 and P7 ends of your library. Those get flowed in over a lawn of oligonucleotides that then bind to those ends. Then you denature your double-stranded DNA library, form bridges by hybridizing to the other side of whichever P5 or P7 didn't originally bind. And then polymerase and nucleotides are added in order to do bridge amplification and amplify these single-stranded molecules. Then the molecules are linearized and denatured again. This happens several times in order to create clusters, which are groups of this different molecules that have the same sequence all within very close proximity on the flow cell slide. At the end, one of the orientations of strands is cleaved from the slide so that you have only one of the adapters that is accessible and it's the same adapter within each cluster. After the flow cell is generated, then the actual sequencing chemistry takes place. A primer is annealed to the accessible adapter and then nucleotides are flowed in through the flow cell. There are fluorophores attached to the nucleotides depending on which Illumina platform you're using between one and four of the nucleotides will contain a fluorophore. And there's also reversible terminators so that only one nucleotide is incorporated in each cycle. So for each cycle, the nucleotides are flowed in, one nucleotide is incorporated, and then between two and four images are taken of the slide at different laser wavelengths in order to figure out which fluorophores correspond to which cluster. Then the reversible terminator is removed. Another set of nucleotides is flowed in. One more nucleotide is incorporated and so on and so forth. And depending on the length of your read, that will determine the number of times this cycle occurs. So for a 50 base read, you're going to have 50 cycles of nucleotides being incorporated and images being taken on the slide. This is just one more schematic that might make a little bit more sense to some people of the same exact thing. This is a high seq flow cell. Here's a small portion of the flow cell, and you can see there are many, many, many clusters within this small portion of the flow cell. The camera can see many fluorophores incorporated into a single cluster, and that determines which base it calls for each sequence. Another thing about sequencing that's very critical to know is whether you want to do single end or paired end sequencing. What I've talked about so far is basically just a single end sequencing reaction. The reaction can be stopped there and you can get all of the reads that you see from these clusters from one end of your insert. Or you can get paired end sequencing, which basically means that this reaction is carried out again, clusters are regenerated, and the opposite orientation of the strands are cleaved so that 
you can sequence from the other end of the strand a fixed length into your insert from the other side. So if this is a 50 base paired end reaction, then you're going to get clusters, you're going to get 50 bases on one side of your, of your insert and 50 bases on the other side of your insert. And this will be true across your entire library. There are different reasons to sequence either single end or paired end. Single end is generally going to be more efficient. It's going to get you better read depth for the amount of money and reagents and time that you're using for your sequencing experiment. Paired end sequencing may be necessary or useful depending on your application. An example of an application where you need paired end sequencing is RNA-seq isoform analysis, where you need a read from one side of the insert and a read from the other side of the insert in order to determine what junctions have been spliced together in your RNA strands. And there's other types of applications that do require paired end, and there's other types of applications that don't, in which case single end might be a better option. Now I'm gonna talk about some potential sequencing issues that you might run into from the instrument itself. One thing that is very important for sequencing is cluster density on a flow cell. And this basically comes down to the quantitation of your library. You need to flow in a precise amount of your library in order to get a good cluster density. If the clusters are too close together, then the camera doesn't have the resolution to actually differentiate those clusters on the slide. If you have too low cluster density, then you're wasting a lot of money because you're not actually sequencing as many things as you could be. So cluster density is important. That being said, it's something that you probably won't need to worry about. It's more of an issue for the sequencing core or facility that you're using that is sequencing your libraries. But you do need to worry about the quantitation that then goes in, into their calculations of what amounts of library are going to give the best cluster density. Base diversity is also something that's incredibly important for the Illumina machine to correctly calibrate how it's doing its laser excitation and image settings and image analysis in order to correctly identify clusters. So for example, if many, many, many of the clusters on this flow cell have an adenine at the second position in this read, then the slide is going to be radiating green and there's not going to be good signal to noise calibration for what should be a fairly even distribution of nucleotides. This is especially important within the first five to 10 bases in your library. If the first five to 10 bases of your library are all the same for every molecule that it's sequencing, then you're going to get garbage data because the machine is not going to be able to properly calibrate what kinds of signal intensities it's looking for. So it's very important to have a mix of nucleotides at any given position. It should be approximately 25% of each nucleotide at any given position, so as not to overwhelm certain signals on the slide. Another issue that definitely occurs in Illumina sequencing is phasing, and this is basically problems with the blocking, unblocking terminator of each nucleotide. So phasing is when either in any given cycle, two nucleotides or zero nucleotides are added instead of just the one nucleotide that it should be, which gets any given molecule out of sequence with the rest of the molecules in that cluster and is going to, over time, create problems for identifying what base should be incorporated at any given position in that cluster. Base diversity also can contribute to phasing problems because if you have many polynucleotide sections in your library, then the software is not going to be able to determine whether phasing is actually occurring. The last thing that you definitely will run into is sequencing errors. Illumina actually has a fairly high sequencing error rate, and this is just errors in which nucleotide is incorporated, where it's a mismatch that's actually incorporated into any given strand. This definitely happens, and it's fairly quantifiable, so as long as you have good enough coverage, you shouldn't have to worry about sequencing errors too much, but if you have low coverage or low depth for your samples, then you might have to be a little bit careful about what kinds of sequencing errors might occur, depending on your application.
These three problems highlighted in blue are problems with loading the flow cell or with the actual fundamental chemistry of the sequencing reaction that Illumina uses. And outside of having good quantification for your library, they're not something that you can do that much about. Your sequencing core or facility can do something about cluster density, but other issues are inherent to the Illumina technology. Phasing in particular, you will see over the length of your read, your read quality is going to decrease. The ends of your reads are going to be more error prone than the beginnings of your reads. And phasing is actually mostly the reason behind this. Base diversity is something that you can't really assess in your library beforehand, except for how your protocol works and what you're expecting to sequence. But it is something that you do need to be aware of when you're preparing your experiment, when you're using your indices. It's also something you can assess later on as something that might be problematic in your library.